uh, to really have a choreography stuff with uh, Professor Lionel Kaplan. In the very beginning, we will just uh, have a brief introduction of Professor Lionel Kaplan. Uh, Professor, uh, you are born in 1931 in Montreal, uh, is it in Canada, I guess? Yes, mm-hmm. Montreal, yes, in uh, Canada. And your uh, schooling is also in the same town. That's right. I went um, to uh, junior schools and uh, senior uh, high schools and then to McGill University in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And I did um, a degree in um, economics and commercial subjects. Mm -hmm. So it was not at all in anthropology. Um, And I, when I left McGill University, I uh, was out of academic life for a six or seven years Mm -hmm. um, in the commercial world. I had different jobs. And then around this time, this would in the late 1950s, a number of uh, countries in the world were becoming independent. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was uh, interesting, or I grew interested in um, some of these issues that were happening or occurring around this time. Uh, particularly outside of the West in Asia and Africa. And I wanted to do a little more study. Um, And I looked around and thought that the best place for me to come or go at that time was um, London. And in particular, the School of Oriental and African Studies, Mm -hmm. uh, which had a wide program of uh, anthropology, and politics and so on. So I wrote to the uh, Department of Anthropology and received a reply from Professor Christoph von Fuhr Heimendorf, probably no. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do anthropology, but he encouraged me to come. Mm-hmm. And I left in uh, 1961 and went to from Montreal and left to go to London, the anthropology studies. Uh, I had to do a kind of uh, preliminary year Mm -hmm. of uh, anthropology courses, which I did. And then I was invited to stay on and do a master's degree, um, a master's uh, thesis. And um, I did that on the subject of land tenure. Mm -hmm. Um, But much of the literature that I was using Um, was in fact from Africa. It wasn't uh, based in Asia so much. Mm -hmm. So I had to, um, I was thinking in fact of going on and doing some work in Africa, but uh, Heimendorf um, persuaded me that perhaps I might be more interested in coming to uh, Asia Mm -hmm. and in particular to Nepal, uh, which I didn't know very much about at all. Uh, I first had to look at a map to see exactly uh, where Nepal was. And once I had discovered that, it was um, more interesting to me. Also, as it turned out, at that time, Professor Dor, well, he wasn't a professor then, Dor Bahadur Bista, uh, was, who was an assistant, um, who had been an assistant to um, Professor Heimendorf when he was doing his Sherpa study. Mm-hmm. Um, was in London. He was at SOAS mm-hmm. because he was um, uh, he was helping um, a man called Clark T. W. Clark, mm-hmm. who was writing a book on the introduction to Nepali language. Mm-hmm. And Dor Bahadur Bista was there to um, help him do this book to write this introduction to Nepali. And um, so I came to know Dor Bahadur Bista. Mm-hmm. And um, Dor Bahadur Bista was, of course, um, um, very prominent in, in those days, Nepali. Mm-hmm. He later became a professor of anthropology when he studied uh, at another place in Columbia mm-hmm. University. Um, but um, gradually I became more and more interested in South Asia anyway, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. I did think also of... Um, uh, working for a time in um, Sikkim, 
uh, particularly on relations between the, um, uh, the Buddhist and Nepali uh, peoples. But uh, India would not consider that because there had just been a war with China and Sikkim was closed mm -hmm. to any foreigners. So perhaps I will do a uh, research mm -hmm. in Nepal. Um, as to where in Nepal, this to some extent was uh, up to Heimendorf because I didn't know one end of Nepal from another. Uh -huh. But he suggested that um, there was an interesting uh, issue of Kipot, land. He knew I was interested in land, uh -huh. in land tenure. Uh -huh. um, and he said, well, you know, in Nepal, in particularly in the East, uh, there is a form of land called Kipot, Kipot and the people called Limbu. Mm -hmm. And it might be interesting for you to go there and do a study there. Mm -hmm. And that um, was how I came to at least decide that I was going to do a, a research uh, program, a project mm -hmm. on the Limbu and of course their Kipot. Um, thank you very much for your um, brief introduction. Uh, and your background of uh, study, uh, why, why you choose your field for Nepal. That is very interesting story. Uh, we, we will uh, uh, discuss about the keyboard in later. Uh, it's a very interesting subject and uh, you have to learn your experience about the keyboard in the, the Limboa uh, because you are in the, your study was more than 50 years before. Your study, your field work in Pinterest. Yes, that's uh, right. Yeah, it's a very interesting for us, like the new generation, to hear from you mm. on how people perceive people and this kind of thing. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll discuss about it later. S O A S, maybe it is the School of Oriental African Studies of London, maybe. Uh, you mm -hmm. teach there 1965 to uh, 1997. Well, that comes a little later because um, after I completed my PhD, my research and my PhD, and uh, I was invited um, to join the staff mm -hmm. at uh, SOAS. Um, the, I should say that there was, a, 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 in 1965, around 1965, there was quite an expansion mm -hmm. of universities in mm -hmm. Britain. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were moving around and one or two people from SOAS, from the staff of SOAS, had gone to join these new universities. And as a result, there was um, a vacancy um, for someone who was interested in um, South Asia, meaning India and Nepal. Mm -hmm. And um, I was invited to join the staff. And so I joined um, even before I had finished my PhD, when I returned from Nepal, I joined the staff and um, was on the staff at SOAS, at the Department of Anthropology, from 1965 until I retired in 1997. So that's 30, I think, 32 years. Yeah, it's uh, about 32 years. Uh, you have some publication. It is uh, about uh, Indian Christian. Uh, Christian. That is the first uh, your first publication. No, um, this was after I had um, finished my research uh, in East Nepal. I did another study actually in uh, the district of Dailek. Uh, several years later, um, I did a study of a district capital. Mm -hmm. um, Dalek Bazaar and the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And I published a book on that. And then in my next project, I went to India. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, quite interested in doing a study. We had small children and we thought it would be by this time, mm -hmm. uh, it would be a good idea to work in a, um, uh, do a research project in a big city. Mm -hmm. And so, we uh, chose Madras, my wife and I chose Madras in Tamil Nadu. And when I was in Madras on a, just a very quick visit on my way back from Nepal to London, um, I noticed that there were 
uh, a great many churches in um, Madras, and I could not understand. This was a Hindu area, and yet here were all these churches as well. And I got interested in the Indian Christian community as a subject of research, as a potential subject of research. So I did some reading when I returned, and a few years later, I returned uh, to Madras to do a study of the Indian Christian community. It was a research interest, not a religious interest. Mm -hmm. um, you have um, uh, publications of land and social change. It is uh, based on your uh, PhD program. Uh, and uh, another uh, publication is a uh, warrior gentleman Gurkhats in western imagination another yes. is uh, anglo indian so that is the um, uh, same from the uh, we talked before like the indian christians are the different no these are these are a different uh, a different group um you see i have a, a very long career so i have done uh -huh. a number of different projects um the uh, the Gurkha book, the book on Gurkhas, uh -huh. started, of course, my interest started when I was in Ilan, in, in, um, uh, in Limbu, Limbuan, as it were, because a number of the people, of the, uh, of the men, mm -hmm. had either been in the Gurkhas uh, mm -hmm. or were serving in the Gurkhas when I was there, mm -hmm. um, and I got interested in the Gurkhas. Mm -hmm. So when I returned to London, I read a little bit about the mm -hmm. uh, what had been written about the Gurkhas, and most of what had been written was by the British officers, not mm -hmm. the Gurkhas themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, the British officers had um, presented the Gurkhas in a very special way. Mm -hmm. They were the bravest of the brave, as the, was the usual um, uh, way in which they introduced them and spoke about them. And I got interested in the way in which the Gurkhas were uh, talked about, were written about by the British, uh, as opposed to what the Gurkhas themselves would say, or the Gurkha people had, would say uh, when I talked to them about their service. Mm -hmm. So um, also at the same time, in um, in anthropology, there had been a growing interest in the way anthropologists wrote about the people. They studied um, and as a, as a way almost of the literature of, of anthropology. This became a, a subject of, of a lot of uh, interest. And um, I thought it might be interesting to write a book about the way in which British officers wrote about their Gurkhas, the Gurkhas they had served with, of course, and um, uh, what this, how this uh, uh, writing um, and the reason for this writing um, could be understood and, and interpreted. And that's what I did, as it were. It was a, a subject uh, or a project which I didn't have to go to the field for, which I did in the library, as it were, at, uh, in, in, in London. And so I published um, a book called Warrior Gentlemen, because this is the way the British very often talked about them. They were not only warriors, they were also gentlemen. Um, so that's the history, as it were, of the, uh, the book on Gurkha. Uh, Professor, you mean the, for the Gurkha warrior, uh, you, have, uh, you have done your research and a British officer um, wrote a book, and uh, you have also uh, some field work with the uh, Gurkhas who they are in uh, London or somewhere. Um, no, not really. Um, most of the uh, the work with the uh, the Gurkhas with the Nepali mm -hmm. uh, end of this uh, project, um, I did in Ilam uh, uh, when uh, I was there, and then of course I did return to Ilam. Uh, after my initial 23 years, after my initial um, project, my initial research, I went back to Ilam uh, for four months in 1988. Oh, 1988. Yeah, and um, I this was when 
uh, perhaps we'll talk about this later, but the keypot had been abolished. Ah, and so ah. I went, uh, I obviously wanted to see what people felt about the, um, about the abolition and how it had affected the people I had known, of course, and in, in Ilam, in the village. So um, uh, the, the, um, the Gurkha book, uh, and, and I also, sorry, I, I also, at this time, met a number of Gurkhas um, or ex-Gurkhas as well and talked to them about, um, about their service, about their uh, future, about their experiences. And um, with this material, which I had collected both in 1964 when I was there, in Bisekaya's Barasa uh, Sal, and also um, in 1988, 23 years later. And I did in London uh, talk to some of the officers. So I met a number of British officers and with this material, I wrote the book on the Gurkhas. Okay, it's a very interesting. So I want to hear some of your interesting uh, stories about your uh, in, in trance of field uh, from the uh, London to Nepal and Kathmandu yeah. to Ilam. That, that might be interesting story. Right. Well, um, I arrived in Kathmandu for the first time in 1964. Um, I was uh, hosted by Dor Bahadur Bista, mm -hmm. uh, who had been in London, as I said, and um, was back in Kathmandu. And I stayed with him for a few days while I received my permits and my permissions and so on. And... Um, at that time, there was um, only an air, air airport outside of Kathmandu in uh, in Biratnagar, in the east, only in Biratnagar. There were no airports in in later, which were later built in Badarapur and so on. So I arranged to fly to Biratnagar, and uh, through Professor Heimendorf. Um, the, uh, the Gurkha camp was in Dharan, which was just a little bit far, for a few miles from Biratnagar. And I was met at the airport and taken to, the, to Dharan, where I stayed for uh, two or three days. And they arranged or helped me to arrange uh, the porters, uh, which I, the Bahari Manche, which I needed to, uh, to walk. Um, now, I... Um, as I said, I was, uh, I grew up in Montreal, in a big city, and I was living in London, an even bigger city, and the mountains are not something I knew or ever walked in before, seriously walked in, and here I was preparing to walk for something like seven days mm -hmm. with my porters all the way to Ilam, which I did, I... <laughs> It wasn't easy, but I made, finally made it to Ilam. And um, I, in fact, at that time, there were some Peace Corps. Uh, I don't know if the Peace Corps is still in Nepal, but at that time, there were two or three people in Ilam Bazaar uh, from the Peace Corps. And they very uh, generously allowed me to stay with them for a few days while I arranged uh, my, uh, to find an, an area to settle in to do my research. And of course, as a, as a foreigner, as a Westerner, um, I was a subject of some uh, curiosity. Mm -hmm. And um, the Jilla Panchayat um, uh, representative uh, came and met me and said, would you like to, he knew I was looking for a, a place to stay, to, to live, to do my research. And he uh, said, you can come to my uh, village at that time. This was, of course, the panchayat system at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, through him, I managed to find or a place to settle, which was about two or three miles from Ilam Bazaar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a house that was empty. Um, as it happens, it was empty because there several people in the house had died. Wow. And the people who uh, wow. 
owned it said, we don't want to live here anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't realize mm -hmm. this. <laughs> Nobody told me this. So I settled there. And uh, at that point, um, I had a place to start. It was, um, uh, I call it a village, but in fact, it was a group of settlements which where limbus were concentrated mm -hmm. and um, where there was kipot mm -hmm. land. And I knew by this time that I wanted to do a study of the kipot system as, along with the, the limbus uh, who uh, owned the land, owned the kipot. And um, it was a series of small gants um, which were contiguous, which were one after the other, and there were four of them that I identified. And um, I was able to start my work um, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in these settlements, which I later call the Indrami settlements. Um, I, there was a beautiful rainbow at one point and somebody said, look at that Indrani. And I thought, well, perhaps I'll call it the Indrani settlements. Mm -hmm. At that time, my Nepali was only very rough, very be, mm -hmm. very elementary. And so I had, um, from the bazaar, I had a, an assistant, a young man, uh, who uh, was looking for some work mm -hmm. and whose English was quite reasonable. And uh, he came and stayed with me, uh, but very, very early on in the in the research, um, I realized that I was not exactly very popular mm -hmm. with the Pradhan Panch, mm -hmm. because he was not a friend. Mm -hmm. He was in fact uh, an opponent mm -hmm. of the Jila Panchayat mm -hmm. representative, mm -hmm. and who had introduced me to the village. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was not very popular with the, um, <laughs> the Pradhan. Mm -hmm. So it took me a little while to, uh, as it were, find my way uh, between them to um, negotiate mm -hmm. uh, my place in the, play, in the bazaar. So I, immediately it became apparent mm -hmm. that um, uh, I was, I was as it were showing, or at least I was demonstrating through my settlement there, I was demonstrating some of the cleavages, some of the uh, op oppositions that existed at the time. But uh, luckily I was finally accepted by most of the people, I think. And um, uh, I began to uh, meet uh, members of different households, and of course, the, the Limbu uh, households were uh, always very uh, ready to talk about their kipot, if I asked them about their kipot, because of course, much of it had been lost to the other castes, the higher castes. And um, so I was able to gather a fair amount of uh, data information about the the land and the uh, practices and habits and customs as uh, an anthropology uh, student always does, if he can. I, I have uh, two curiosity to understand here. The one is uh, you made a uh, trekking journey in Dharan to uh, Ilam. Uh, how many days were you in Ilam? The one is mm -hmm. that uh, order mm -hmm. is, um, uh, as you told, um, um, you have a little uh, misunderstanding with um, Pradhan Poncha and it's, uh, he's not accepting you very uh, good way. So have you um, encountered any kind mm -hmm. of obstacles um, by the Pradhan Poncha and administrative uh, giving unnecessary trouble, this kind of thing? Have you encountered uh, because of you that have a uh, good acceptance? Um, well, first to answer your first question, um, it took uh, seven days mm -hmm. to reach from Dharan um, to, uh, to Ilam. Mm -hmm. um, 
by on foot, of course. I walked uh, uh, the whole way and with my seven porters. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was on my way to Elam. One more, mm -hmm. I, I'll, if I interrupt you. Uh, that time, uh, there was no any roadway. There, was no, there were no roads. The east-west highway had not yet been built. Um, uh, when I returned after 23 years, mm -hmm. there was an east-west road. I was able to travel by bus from Kathmandu all the way to a place called Birtamor. Uh, and from there, I could take another bus mm -hmm. up to Ilam because Ilam. they were building the, yeah. the highway up to, um, I think it was Panchta mm -hmm. and eventually Teratu. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but when I went first in 19 Bisekais, uh, um, there was nothing. Uh, and so I had to walk the whole way from Bir uh, Biratnagar. And as for your second, <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't have a problem with the Pradhan Panch. The Pradhan Panch had a problem with the Jila Panch uh, representatives. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was in the middle, mm -hmm. uh, Bichma, you see. And so uh, he was annoyed that mm -hmm. I was there in his Panchayat mm -hmm. um, without his permission. Uh, um, so uh, I had to explain as carefully as I could. I had to show him my my permit, which I had received in Kathmandu uh, from the, the ministry. I think it was the, uh, I, I don't remember exactly which ministry, but I had to go for a permit to do research mm -hmm. in Nepal. I showed him that and uh, gradually uh, he, uh, I attended his uh, uh, meetings in the panchayat, of course, and I allowed him to uh, um, to invite me for a meal, and so he we became we became uh, companions of one kind or another. Wow. We were able to to get along, so it was not a very long uh, problem. It didn't it didn't um, you know it didn't go on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Very soon, I think we were able to uh, resolve any differences that he felt um, uh, with me. But this is the uh, usual thing, I think. Uh -huh. This happens very often in the field when you come and you are introduced by one person, but someone else who may not uh, have been uh, able to introduce you was is annoyed with your um, uh, with the way you came to be in this place. Okay, so that, that's uh, field work, I'm afraid. Uh -huh. that, that means a uh, little bit egoistic problem because he is the uh, uh, Pancha of the territory and you are introduced by someone others. That, that, that is why he is a little bit annoyed to you. Maybe. Okay, so we'll look uh, more forward for the uh, Indrani settlement as you mentioned in your book that they are Ambung. Bharapa, Chitok, and Doramba, the four, four small gowns, mm -hmm. you, you quoted it uh, in the settlement. And, and mm -hmm. uh, as you as you written in your book, uh, that there was a uh, uh, settlement in uh, different ethnicities like the uh, Bahun, Daisi, Tetri, Limbu, Mughal, Rai, Taman, Guru, Mihar, uh, Sarki, Kanu, Damai. I want to know about the here. These castes are beside the Limbu. Uh, of course, the Limbu are the indigenous, uh, but they are originally from there. The other caste, like a uh, uh, bound Jaisi Chetri, uh, is there any other caste uh, are uh, from the same territory? They they claim themselves uh, they are the indigenous, or that they are just uh, thinking we are migrate from the other uh, uh, other places. Like uh, here, I want to know if the indigenous uh, first people and the migrants, uh, how is your experience? Uh, does it make sense uh, what I want to ask? <laughs> no, I. Um... The, the history, of course, of, of, of the, the area, it was never, uh, never really written. Uh, there may be some now, but at that time, it was very unclear mm -hmm. how these various castes, the high castes in particular, had come into the area. And so part of my research was to try to understand the way in which the higher castes in particular had come into the eastern part of the country, 
where there were already settled a number of Limbu people, the, the, the Limbu people. Now, in some of the myths and some of the myths, yes, I suppose, not wrong, I was going to say histories, but not really histories. Uh, there was the idea that some of the people uh, who had preceded the Limbus, who were there even before, were the Lepchas, uh, who um, were at that time mainly in Sikkim. There were, I, I never met any Lepchas. Mm -hmm. But so there was a, the idea that perhaps the Lepchas had been in East Nepal, in, Ki, in, in uh, Limbuan, before the Limbus actually came. Um, but certainly after the Limbus were settled, um, the, and the, the um, establishment of the state of Nepal by Prithvi Narayan, um, the higher castes um, were the, uh, uh, the Bounds, the Chetris, the Takuris, began to move east into the Limbu area. And the whole um, issue of the way in which they obtained and acquired land from the Limbus uh, with the help of the, the government um, and through their own uh, devices um, became obviously the subject of, of much of my research and how the Limbu land, the Kipot, had been lost to these members of higher castes. Uh, became again the uh, the subject of much of my research. Okay. Um, Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not quite yeah. sure if I answered yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. That is the thing. I, I just want to uh, make it clear. And all the things um, that is, uh, you present uh, cleavage between the two uh, belief system uh, or two practices. One practices from the limbus, and they have the one uh, cultures and the belief system and the practices and the other is the, from the Brahmin or the high caste Hindu people. So they have the, another kind of the practices and the belief, belief systems in there. Um, uh, you have written somewhere, uh, Limbu has two plans. That is one is from the Lhasa Gotra and another is Kasi Gotra. Um, how, um, how you have the data or the myth about this? One? This is uh, something that was very, uh, not terribly important in the, um, in the, uh, in the, the, the way in which the Limbus divided themselves or explained their history. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the Lhasa Gotra and Kasi Gotra didn't really ever emerge inside in the, in the, uh, in the village during the, the um, research. Mm -hmm. It was not something that anybody said, this divides us from the other one, or this one is, the, is different than the other because of the, this classic uh, Kasi uh, division. It was something that was mentioned um, on one or two occasions, but never. Mm -hmm. uh, really became an important issue. Whereas, of course, the, 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 the Tars, the lineages and so on, these were important divisions mm -hmm. and whether people were um, entitled to Kipot in this particular area, as opposed to those who might not, who were other lineages and did not have uh, the rights to Kipot in this area, the lim in the Indraini cluster. So, these became the more important divisions, whether you had the right to keep pot or whether you had you didn't have the right to keep pot. Um, and this could affect the whole way in which, of course, people were able to function, to live in, in the area. Um, so the, the, the other gotra was, was something that really I mentioned because it was told to me, but it was not really at all important. And in fact, I'd forgotten about it. Okay. Uh, it, uh, they, they are just uh, taking as a uh, reference. We are from last year, uh, last year, Kasi, that they, uh, they just, uh, some, it is uh, sometimes uh, occasional, yeah. uh, but it is not a very uh, big issue for them. Okay. Have you ever so, heard of this? Uh, does this exist in Sankwa Saba at all? This division? Yeah, yes, uh, in, in my childhood when I was in village, uh, sometimes, uh, as, as you told, it, it comes, the, it used to come to here sometimes, not like a functional way, not like a, the uh, rooted way, like a, 
I am from the last Lhasa Gotra, so they mm. are different from the our and 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 now it is uh, it has a different discourse. Even I'm not up that much. You, know, you have the very old data. So okay, uh, somewhere there uh, there was a very interesting word. I I uh, as you mentioned with your some of the informants, uh, some of the informants told that that Tongba is the uh, limbo god. Mm -hmm. And that I want to hear some history about the, your informants, uh, how he... Well, of course, the, the, the Tongba uh, was a very important uh, institution uh, in, uh, among the Limbus. Mm -hmm. um, rituals were very often concluded with the Tongba. So the group would come together by sharing the mm -hmm. Tongba. Mm -hmm. um, the... Um, uh, at marriages, Tongba was extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, when, for example, the, 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 br the bride would arrive with her bridesmaids, mm -hmm. um, they would be housed in a sp special place and they would be given Tongba. So Tongba constantly was the, 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 uh, an important part of virtually all uh, limbu uh, relations, uh, social relations. When people came visiting, you gave them a tongba. Um, so tongba was was very much, uh, as as you say, a, a limbu god, or at least that yeah. someone told me this is a limbu god. But of course, people outside the limbu uh, area or people outside the limbu um, society um, thought that limbus were terribly. Uh, uh, drank too much and uh, constantly drinking uh, Tongba, spending their money on Tongba. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, mm -hmm. was, uh, to some extent, it was important uh, for them. It, it was uh, uh, an extremely uh, vital part of, of any uh, ceremony, any ritual, and so on. So, um, you know, whatever they said about, from people outside, whatever they said about the Limbu, tendency to drink was was uh, not really something that the Limbus worried about too much. It was something that was vital for them and vital in their daily social lives. Um, have you any, uh, have you ever, ever found some kinds of meat, uh, meat uh, related to the Tongba and the Zand and Rapsi um, in the Limbu community? Myth, you mean? Myth, uh, like oh, myths. Uh, no, I didn't. Actually, I, I don't remember any myths about about the Tongba, how the Tongba came to be mm -hmm. so important in Limbu life. Um, uh, it, it just wasn't something that they had to explain. It was there. It was part of their, their everyday experience. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't seek to find a, a myth or didn't relate to me any. Perhaps I missed it, but it was no, there was no mythology about it. Okay. about Tongba. Tongba was there. Okay, we are um, uh, spending more time here because we want to talk more about the keeper. So I want to very uh, brief information about uh, the interdependence of the two community uh, before mm -hmm. you present the cleavage of the two belief systems and the two practices, Limbu and the Brahmin, and later on you mm -hmm. uh, present the inter interdependence, how they are interdependent with others. Mm -hmm. And um, there is the relations between the uh, debtors and creditors, the Limbu are debtors and the uh, Brahmins are creditors and the Limbus are the tenant um, within their own land and uh, the Brahmins have become the landlords. Limbus are become uh, uh, agricultural uh, labor and Brahmins are become the farmers and the small landholders there. I, I want to uh, know about uh, how the Brahmins uh, immigrants uh, become uh, more uh, wealthy or more richest than the Limbu. That is the curiosity. Um, I want to know how they are become that. Um, well, um, when the Limbus were living, as it were, years ago in the in this area, mm -hmm. um, the main problem was was labor. They didn't have enough labor to 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 work their land, and with the arrival of the other castes, in particular in this area, the Brahmins, um, 
they became, as it were, they, they worked the Limbu land. Um, and the Limbus gave them grants of Kipot, and they worked on the land, and it was a good relationship until such time as the government began to interfere in a way. So at the, at the beginning, they decided that the land that had been granted to the Brahmins or other, other castes, the, the kipot that had been granted, would become Raikar. So they, they the, the government was the one that, as it were, changed the, uh, the tenure from a kipot tenure to Raikar. And this, of course, involved a huge loss for the Limbus. So the Brahmins were no longer laborers or rather the tents of the Limbu Kipatiyas. They were suddenly their own, their own uh, masters on their land and they had Raiko. So the Limbus lost a lot of their land. It was only, I think in 1901, if I remember correctly, that this was not allowed any longer. They would not change Kipot to Raikar any longer. So this was how it started. The Brahmins and the other castes coming in and being granted by the Limbus the land, the part of their kipot, in order to be able to work the land. Um, in time, the other castes were able to acquire more and more of the Limbu land, and the Limbus became ultimately dependent on these other groups for their survival, for their uh, economy, as it were. And so you had the, the what, what developed was a system in which the Limbus became the tenants on their own lands very often because they needed to work. They needed they they passed on the the uh, their kipot under mortgage, which was the next way in which they were able to acquire some kind of means of, of survival. And the mortgages. Bogbandaki, two kinds, mainly Bogbandaki and Masikata. Mm -hmm. And the mortgages which were given to the Limbus um, meant that the Brahmins and the other castes had the land, but the Limbus were the tenants on their own land and worked um, and were able to, to only survive in this way. So from the uh, a situation where the, the, the Limbus were the more dominant groups in, in the East, had the Kipot, in time they lost the Kipot uh, to the Brahmins, and what Kipot they had was taken under mortgage by the other castes, by the Brahmins and other ones. Um, and um, the Limbus ultimately became the, the, the agricultural laborers on the the tenants and laborers on the land, on their own lands, uh, which were in more under mortgage to the Brahmins. I, I want to explore a little about it. Um, what was the major factor that, that uh, derives a limbu, uh, that uh, makes a limbu people poorer and poorer every day? They, they, they are being poorer and poorer. Uh, because they have the uh, land resource and they have the uh, subba systems and they are the people they have the subba and they are the, the headmen of their and, and later on how they are become the poor of poor um, because they have this um, uh, land resource and all the brahmins and all the people to become uh, uh, richer and uh, well be because of the same um, uh, resource. So what was the major factor that is the one I want to uh, hear something from you? It's difficult to say what exactly was the main factor, but I think the, um, the fact that the dominant castes in Kathmandu in, 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 the, in the government mm -hmm. were the high castes and that they were willing to um, allow the high castes to acquire land, uh, to change land from Kipot to Raikar, um, that they were more educated. This was, uh, they were literate, mm -hmm. which one, at the beginning, thing, the Limbus were not literate mm -hmm. one thing to the same extent at all. Yeah. So I think there were a whole series and there were, I mean, the courts, the mall, all these government offices 
were dominated by high castes mm -hmm. and they always would favor the high castes in any dispute, in any um, problem that, that uh, in any uh, um, problem that the, the, that arose between the Limbus and the, uh, the Kipatias and the, the people who came to take their land. So I think there were a whole series of, of uh, circumstances which enabled the higher castes um, to um, uh, eat Limbu land, which is the uh, another common, you know, Jaga Kanu was the uh, another favorite expression. And I don't think it was only because some of the higher castes might have been uh, dishonest, jolly. This is, you know, this may have been in some cases why, but in other cases, I think it was mo mainly it was the government, um, high caste government dominated by the high castes and literate um, Brahmins and literate members of high castes and took advantage of the, the limbus amongst whom they settled um, and worked and were dependent on. Mm -hmm. That, that, that means the high caste peoples uh, have the power of education and uh, they, they are uh, making the policy in favor of the high caste and that is why the Libu are illiterate and they, they are not aware about the uh, policy and this kinds of administrative thing. That is why they are uh, losing their land day by day. Uh, at, as I, I, I think, yes, I think this was it. And of course, there were also some dishonest uh, members of the high caste who were able to steal, as it were, nearly steal the lands. But I think it was mostly because there was this dominance um, of the high caste in the government and the literacy, which enabled them to really uh, control a lot of the um, of the, um, uh, the administration, the land administration, and so on. So there were any number of things which were contributing to this loss of kipot, loss of, of, of power and uh, in, in, in the, uh, amongst Limbus. Mm, well, uh, we, are, we are already some, somewhere uh, in the kipot, but um, uh, now I want to know about the very the basic uh, definitions of the kipot, uh, because I found some of the post books and uh, some, some book writers, they are uh, misinterpreting the kipots, and I found some, uh, they are teaching in the LLB, it's a Bachelor of Law, in Nepal, Kipot land. They are telling like uh, uh, it is communal land hold and it is under the command of the uh, community headman and uh, he can appoint someone um, as his virtue and, and community headman can even withdraw the uh, land holding power. And, and they are they are misinterpreting like uh, uh, community members um, uh, get portion of land according to their contribution to community and these kinds of misinterpretations are uh, teaching in course. Very often you're right that sometimes you hear that Kipot is a kind of communal mm -hmm. land system. Um, I don't think that's a good way of describing uh, certainly in my, my experience of, of Kipot. But Kipot is, is based on your place in a lineage system. Mm -hmm. And so the, each, um, each area, for example, would have a first settler, mm -hmm. somebody who came to the land, mm -hmm. who came to this place, mm -hmm. who settled the land, who cleared it, who cleared the jungle. Mm -hmm. And there, this group, would be in that area would be the Kipotias, the main Kipotias. Um, and they would have the right and the, their descendants would then acquire a, a portion of that land when, when it was divided, when uh, uh, they, um, they became of age and no uh, lineage from another tar who was not part of that first settler uh, would be able to have kipot, would be given kipot, would be allowed to have kipot. So 
um, it depends very much on the place, your, your place in the lineage system, in the system of the Tar. And so, for example, in, um, in Ilam, where I was, in the Indraini settlements, the, the main Kipatias were the Chabegus, the Chabegu Tegims. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the name, that, that the, their, their Tar name. And there were one or two others also that had Kipatia rights in that land. But anyone who was not from those Tars would not have rights to land. So the, the Suba would not have the right to simply give the land mm -hmm. to another person or withdraw the land. Mm -hmm. If they tried, they might have trouble. I think it would not be acceptable. So that is how, um, how I would define the Kipot system, a system of land holding, which would be uh, based on your place in the tar, in the system of, of lineages in tars. Oh, really? Whereas yeah. Rikar, by, by comparison, Rikar, anybody could buy. Yeah. If you had money, you could buy it. Um, you could buy the, the Rikar of, uh, on any land. So that it didn't matter which lineage you were from or which tar, which caste or anything. Uh, first, I want to um, uh, hear something from you. Uh, in your uh, book, page number 55, um, there is a small quote. Uh, the term Kipot itself uh, seems to have originated in the western part of the country and only reaches Limbuan some years after imposition of the Gorkha rules. Uh, this is your lines and you have the footnote there and you have quoted um, to Kipalananga and the Chamjong and later on you have you give this small in in fact that these writers imply as a, um, as some indian informant insists the keypot is a limbo world that is the um, I thing i want to hear um when when i was there and i was wondering if you have the, the some informants and the informants and the primary data about Keep it. I mean, I don't know how reliable his data uh, from your informants, mm -hmm. but uh, if some some informants from the your primary data, they are uh, they are thinking or they are planning like uh, uh, keep this limbo world and how you uh, uh, more focus on the secondary data. That is, uh, uh, being an anthropologist, I was uh, uh, confused and how you use the secondary is the cost and the primary is in the footnotes that is the one i want to i want to hear from you um as far as i know kipot is not a limbo word mm -hmm. um kipot it may have been used by or, or or declared by the by the government by prithvi narayan because he would um uh, grant uh, Lalmoars to Limbus, um, only not only Limbus, but we can come to that in a minute. But um, and declare these to be Kipot, and they could be used by the Limbus and so on. So I don't think Kipot was ever regarded as a Limbu word. In fact, Kipot did exist among other groups as well. Although by the time I came to Nepal. Um, I don't think very many other groups had the, had kipot because they had already been abolished. It had already been abolished among most of the other groups. But I have been um, told by one or two other researchers that there was still a little bit of kipot, and that certainly historically there was kipot among various other groups, particularly the Rai, um, and possibly even. Uh, the Tamangs and, and Gurungs, but this was a long time ago, if at all. But Kipot was was uh, was a, a term which probably was uh, given by the by the um, Pritvinarayans in Pritvinarayans time by the government uh, when it granted lands um, to the to the uh, others and to the Limbus in particular. I don't think it was uh, at all uh, ever. If anybody suggested it's a keeper, it's a limbo word. It's it's not so. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, because I I want to hear from you because of uh, in in even the Nepali chapter course they are not uh, given clearly and it is uh, like the same we talk about it is the communal land and something and something mm. and and uh, they are not giving the, the very the uh, origin root of the word and and mm. I I want to uh, hear from you if your informants have some reference like if what is uh, this this uh, limbukura e and path and something these kinds of things if you have any uh, uh, stories or the narrations that was the I want to hear I I want to know about the mm, all those thing about the keeper the features of keeper limbu peoples they cannot uh, sell their keeper land. Uh, it is because of uh, they don't have a mm. uh, proper um, paper of um, uh, land land holding or communal or the belief system so they cannot uh, sell their land they can only mortgage that is the thing i want to uh, i want to uh, hear from you because limbo uh, the keeper land it is not sellable but it can be mortgaged mm. it is it is by the uh, by the policy or the by the belief system or the does it make mm -hmm. sense profession what i want to hear well i think uh, this is not of course unusual um, among the limbu um, very often land in tribal societies so-called tribal society was not a saleable thing it was not something that you could as it were alienate mm -hmm. um, so Kipot was simply uh, land which was associated with the Limbus. And if you couldn't use it, then another member of the Tar or the lineage would use it. Um, would, and it would go from one to the next, from one generation to the next. But it was not something that was ever considered inalienable. It was uh, not a commodity. It was not something you could buy and sell. It was simply um, something which was associated with your group, with your lineage, with your community, with your tribe. And you, um, uh, you did not consider it something you could sell uh, as you could break off. Limbu, uh, I don't think it was ever a discussion about selling Limbu land, selling Kibot. Kibot was simply part of you. You didn't sell a part of you. It was not, it was something that you, you regarded as your essence, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your, uh, your uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I'll have to think about it another time, but it's, it's, um, it's something that you just uh, assumed was part of you. It was part of your um, your ethnicity. It was part of your uh, understanding of, of, of the world. And you just did not consider selling it. So I think this is something that uh, that is, is very widespread in many parts of, the, of, of South Asia, for example. The tribes of India also had land which was part of their their existence part of their life did not mm -hmm. consider it alienable, saleable. Mm -hmm. um, and Kipot was like that. So it was not something that you, you could mortgage it, you could lend it to someone. Um, you could, if you had to um, give it to a, a, an affine, give it to somebody who came, a, a relative who came and needed the land, you might be able to to allow them to use the land but not to sell it well uh, you mean the the keypot land is uh, uh, more emotional attachments and uh, the belief systems and uh, they have the moral attachment with the uh, with the land and they never think about it is sellable community uh, commodity and and another words i want to uh, quote it here uh, the keypot was nibbled at um, uh, not salad whole. Uh, that is uh, your uh, mm, word from the, your book. Wait, could you read that again? Okay. Keep it was nibbled at. 
not salad all. No, I didn't. I didn't understand that. Keeper towards nibble it. Maybe it is uh, they are uh, biting little and little and not salad the whole. Oh, right, oh, right, 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 right. Nibbled, not so, uh, not uh, not swallowed. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this relates to this comment related to the way in which over the years, many many years, Limbu lands gradually were taken away from them by the government, by the higher castes, and it wasn't suddenly taken away in one fell swoop. It wasn't some slowly and over time. And therefore I use the word nibbled, meaning you don't, you just take little bits at a time, but you didn't swallow it completely. And uh, that was a way of saying it took a long, long time for the land, for the kipot and the limbu land to to uh, be alienated to other groups. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I want to a little bit about uh, your fieldwork. It was uh, near about the end of the uh, abolition uh, kipot. Um, it was uh, a by act. It is. Uh, 1963 and your field work is 1964 and 65 so mm -hmm. um, how people are perceiving uh, like the keep up the abolition um, in the local level um, especially uh, limbo peoples how they are mm -hmm. reacting about the abolition of uh, keep up and that time, so maybe the uh, uh, limbo subas are still at distance, more or less, because uh, I am I, I born in 1984, and I may know about from the 1990. Even that time, there was some domination from the uh, limbo subas. Uh, they have still some powers uh, in the community. So I want to hear from you some experience about the. Yeah, abolition of Kipot and reactions of the Limbu peoples and the Subas. Well, when I was there in 64 and 65, um, 1964, 65, there, the Kipot still was very much extant. It, it was, it existed and it was still there. But of course, there had been land reforms been introduced and it was gradual. It wasn't introduced in Limbuan until quite a few years later. So when I left, after I left uh, in 65, um, the land reform only came to this area, to Ilam, in about 1968 or 69. And so at that time, um, the Limbus were told they could have some of the land back, some of their um, mortgages had to be repaid, and so on. There were a whole series of um, uh, propositions that the Limbus would not suffer too much by, the, by this land reform. It would can be converted, the, the kipot would be converted into, into Rikar. Um, but <clears throat> when I returned, to uh, this area 23 years later in 1988. Um, and I asked people what had happened. They said, basically, they had lost their land. Um, the idea was that they wouldn't lose it all, that some of them would keep some of the land um, that was under mortgage to the high caste. But in fact, um, it was something that the, didn't happen that they had lost virtually all their land. What had happened? Well, people were saying, we are now leaving. A lot of them had left, they said. Um, they went away. They went to Muglan um, or they went somewhere else uh, without any land. Uh, they had to leave. They said, uh, who are we? Now, without kipot, what is the limbu without a keep without kipot? Um, this was this was something that they felt very strongly about emotionally and in every other way. Um, to some extent, the 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 subas uh, who, who had many of whom 
had become very poor uh, along with, with all other Limbus. The Subas still had some myth, almost mythical uh, uh, status in the Limbu community. They still sometimes would, would um, um, look up to their Subas. They would sometimes still bring them gifts or uh, of, of pay some kind of homage, pay some kind of attention to the to the Subas. Um, but it was not very, not based as it were on the Subas role in the Kipot because there was no more Kipot. So the Subas were simply uh, almost a, a reason for people to, to try to remember their attachment to Kipot because the Subas were very vital at one time in the in the control of, of Kipot, in the way in which Kipot was distributed and so on. But this was no longer possible since there was no longer any Kipot. So I didn't find that there was a great deal of, of uh, uh, attention paid to the, to the Subas uh, in the area that I was in. It's possible that there were, you know, there was, it was different in other parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that is because I want to uh, hear from you because of your experience and that was uh, the same time that you got abolitions and uh, your fieldwork and 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 also it is because some of the the community is still they have a strong uh, belief in the headmans like uh, in the Tarai they are they still in the Mukia and uh, Taudari uh, even even they they consult each and every. Um, uh, everything happens in the community they, before uh, first they consult with the Mukia or the Chaudhari. So how was the practices um, and uh, the positions of the Subhas at that time in your fieldwork? Well, we have to now, now come back to the Gurkhas mm -hmm. for a moment because there were a number of ex-Gurkhas in the Indraini cluster uh, several of whom had been um, officers and therefore quite important and who had um, a very good income from the pension. Mm -hmm. And they had become extremely important in the community, in the Limbu community. In fact, they become important even in the wider community. So, the only people, for example, that if they had a wedding, the, only, the, 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 the bounds would also come to the wedding, whereas normally a Limbu wedding would only be attended by Limbus, not by any other castes. And so when the, um, these uh, Gurkha, ex-Gurkhas um, came back from their uh, service after maybe 20 years and they <clears throat> very frequently took mortgage, took under land, uh, under uh, mortgage, some of the kibbutz uh, that, that their, uh, their relatives had. Um, they became very wealthy. They were very wealthy. And with their pensions, they became even wealthier. So they built big houses. Then they became important. And I think in this area, particularly, they replaced the subas as the, the roles to which uh, people would would uh, um, would give uh, would give their respect and so on. Um, so that may be unique to this area because not all areas would have s important ex Gurkhas, but to the extent that the um, that in this area the Gurkhas had ex Gurkhas had really become more important. Uh, they became more important than the Subas. Um, and so people would look to them to settle disputes, whereas before they might go to the Suba to help them resolve a dispute. Well, uh, I want to remember uh, one more um, ritual priest, Phelangma, and the position and the power uh, of Phelangma, how the uh, people perceive Phelangma, and he has uh, some kinds of the, like the uh, customary uh, right.
lights also or he can influence any other decision to making or that kinds of the thing or he have uh, he has only role in the processions of the rituals only um, how, how is your experience about the Fedangmas? Mm. Well, there were um, at least two or three Fedangmas in this area. Um, they were uh, they were approached to uh, help with uh, with rituals, limbu rituals. So they the, the rituals at the limbus in this area um, were very mixed. Sometimes they at this time they had a ritual. Uh, but at other times, it was a completely limbu ritual, uh, only in limbu kura, and uh, the fadangma were approached for uh, to to conduct a number of rituals. Um, when the people were ill, they very often would phone would call the um, phone would call the the fadangma to uh, to conduct a ritual uh, to. Uh, um, to find the cause, to find the reason for illness, to um, uh, if there were if a if a spirit was uh, was suspected uh, to get rid of the spirit um, and so on. So they were very much a part of 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 everyday life in the Limbu community, and the Limbus um, had a number of rituals which were completely uh, within their own Limbu. Uh, limbu culture and for Dangma, they also had a, uh, a bijua, um, uh, which another uh, important ritual expert. Uh, but occasionally they would call dhamis as well. So the dhami, who was not necessarily a limbu, uh, would come and, and perform rituals. So there was very, very much um, a mixed kind of ritual world that they lived in. But uh, certainly the the um, fedangma was a vital part, and of course at weddings, uh, the uh, the the limbu fedangma would come to perform the the ceremony. Um, they were a, a vital part of the of the um, everyday life of the of the community of the limbu community. Mm -hmm. yeah. That that is why I want I, I, I want to uh, know about little bit about because uh, fedangma have the vital role uh, in the limbu dead day-to-day -day life and the ritual, mm -hmm. ritual performance. Um, does they have any um, any role in the decision-making like uh, Kipart and the other kinds of the political uh, issues and the other kinds of economic issues, uh, uh, political like uh, economic and other kinds of issues, they, they have any kinds of the decision-making or the, they can uh, appeal to the community, we have to do this uh, like activism uh, uh, in the current situations and uh, do they have any kinds of these kinds of role also in the community have uh, what is your experience no it was a it was a no it was a completely um, they were confined very much only to the um, the ritual aspects of of of, of the limbo community ritual um, aspects of limbo life um i don't remember any of them uh, in any way involved being involved in in land disputes or in uh, uh, in discussions about about kibbutz and land and so on, they were very much a ritual uh, within the world of, of, of rituals. Um, and that it could be that in, in other areas, uh, the, the fedangma might have been a more influential person within the wider community, but not in not in this area. In this area, the uh, um, as I say, the ex Gurkhas were important, um, um, but in the in in um, in this area, it was it was simply the Fadang was simply uh, a ritual expert, and he stayed within the the ritual world. Uh, now I want to um, hear uh, something about uh, 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 intra conflict uh, limbu and the limbu, uh, because uh, we before we uh, explore some. Um, cleavage between the Limbu and the Brahmins. So now I want to uh, hear something, your experience on the uh, Limbu and the Limbu conflict, what kinds of uh, conflicts they have um, in that times of your field work. You the Limbu Brahmin conflict, you mean? No, no, I mean, I mean, does there any existence of the conflict like a Limbu and the Limbu 
uh, oh. in, in terms of the clan, in terms of the like the uh, land, in terms of the, like the, any kinds of things. Well, uh, at the time I was in in Ilam, um, there were a number of disputes between Limbus. Um, sometimes, usually, it was disputes over land. Um, who you know, encroaching on other people's land, um, or um, um, a misunderstanding about transaction between two limbus. Um, there were disputes, mainly, I think, about marriage, because the limbu, as you know, um, married in several ways, and one of the ways that was very uh, prevalent, popular, uh, was a Jari marriage. And so they would steal, steal is the word, inverted commas, steal someone else's wife. And this, of course, led to, um, to uh, disputes uh, about the payment of, of uh, um, a bride wealth, of reed, of the payment of Jari call, um, and so on. So a lot of disputes about the uh, about marriage uh, and about the um, uh, the existence of jari and 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 so on, um, and some, as I say, about land as well. But uh, if there were, if I was counting the number of disputes between limbus, it would be mostly about marriage or the, the taking of another uh, one's um, wife, rather than. Oh, well, uh, you mean uh, you found some uh, individual level of disputes between the limbu and the limbu. Uh, um, in your fieldwork, but uh, I, um, if you have any any um, experience like uh, uh, groupisms and uh, the uh, other as well, the communal issues, um, they have any kind of uh, uh, issues or that they have uh, different. I'm curious about uh, it because of for your fieldwork, like a 10 to 15 years before, um, like the Palgunanda is the one of the influential um, Limbu ritual um, activists, or now they are making um, the god also one of the uh, group. So, uh, have you any experience about the uh, activism or the uh, Limbu reformations um, activism of Palgunanda or something, some other people? Not really, not in, in, in this area. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think there was, I mean, there were very, very few prominent Limbu um, activists in the area. Remember, this was also um, the Panchayat area. And Mahendra was still the 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 uh, the, the king, and um, any kind of political activity outside the panchayats was really very very uh, frowned on, very risky. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if anybody was was thought to be a, a an activist in this sense, could end up in in uh, in jail and. Uh, in prison, and uh, so there was, uh, it was a, it was a very tightly controlled system, at, and certainly in this area there was no, no serious activism. I mean, the, there had been it was several people knew that there were um, activists in uh, in Darjeeling. Uh, at this time, there was a lot of uh, later on there was a lot of political activity uh, going on in in Darjeeling. Um, and there had been previously to my uh, to my uh, arrival, there had been some uh, riots, I think, in in uh, among Limbus. Uh, but this was before, I think, before the panchayats. But while the panchayat was there, it was very little, very little. Well, um, this might be the very uh, interesting. That we have to talk before. Have you any experience about uh, limbo mundentos uh, uh, after after uh, evolutions of the people? Now uh, uh, we have one the manifest manifestations of that mundum. We have mundum and the best, uh, the least, and this and this. Uh, we have um, uh, cosmology according to our mundum. Uh, so, how is your experience on mundum? <laughs> um. Well, very often when people were telling um, 
uh, relating stories or myths um, or explaining how the Limbus came to, to uh, be in Limbuan, um, they would refer to the Mundums, they would refer to uh, the Ten Limbus, this was Das Limbu would very often arise. Um, so it, it was uh, occasionally a kind of um, mythological charter, as, as you might say. Um, but it didn't play a, a vital role in everyday Limbu um, activity or Limbu uh, explanations of, of what, what was happening because Kipot was there and Kipot very often was, was enough almost to, uh, to explain why the Limbus were where they were and why uh, the Limbus felt as they did. But um, from what I understand, the little bit I understand, since the abolition of Kipot, there have been other ways in which the Limbus have attempted mm -hmm. to coalesce, to keep together. Mm -hmm. And so the Mundum would become much more important. Yes. Uh, and I think there are whole new religious groups now which are emerging among the Limbus, which were never there before. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no temples, Limbu temples in the, mm -hmm. in the area, but now I understand there are Limbu temples, there are cult, cult, Limbu cults, um, which, which are beginning. But I understand that this is now emerging much more. And this, I would say, might replace Kipot as the kind of glue mm -hmm. to keep the community somehow uh, united almost. But this is only, you know, this is only my, uh, my very feeble explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mundum yeah. was not, I mean, Mundum was mentioned, it was there, yeah. but it wasn't something that you yeah. you brought up very frequently at all. You didn't hear much about it. Well, um, as, as you uh, uh, at least because of the monarchy and the panchayat uh, systems also, they, that they will not allow about the religious and other kinds of political activities, maybe mm -hmm. that is the reason. And after the 1990s, um, yeah, there are several groups are emerged and uh, uh, religious and other kinds of the discourse are spread, and now they are they have the different kinds. Maybe that is the one reason. Um, well, um, the last I want to uh, one suggestion or one thing uh, as a, a researcher as a, as a scholar, um, because I always rise in a different discourse. Nepali education is developed. Uh, negativity people so like uh, if i am a nepali and if i have literacy then i feel the negativity i don't have anything we don't have anything we have to all follow the modernizations and the western people the western styles this is why uh, i used to uh, write a different discourse what we have as a strength in the Nepal, uh, like uh, that is uh, maybe a Western or the other part of the, the world, they don't have. Maybe we have something uh, very unique thing as a strength. Uh, Limbu have something very different or very unique from the other world. <laughs> well, um, when I was there in in uh, in uh, Ilam. Uh, there were no, in the village, I should say, in, in the Indraini cluster, there were no schools. There was one, sorry, there was one school for five years and it was sponsored by the ex-soldiers board. So it, it had several Limbu children, but on the whole, the education uh, was very limited. So a few Limbus were able to read and write, but that was, that was all. Um, what, made the, the Limbus different from everyone else. I think uh, at that time it was um, a language. They had their own language. And despite the fact that they were a minority in Ilam, they were even a minority in the, the panchayat uh, that, that uh, the cluster was belonged to, they spoke their language. Um, everybody, they spoke Nepali, of course, they all spoke Nepali, but they spoke Limbu. Um, Kura, and um, to some extent this separated them, um, made them different. They were aware of their difference. They were aware of their food, which was 
slightly different, whereas the bounds would not touch certain foods, the limbus, which the limbus, um, um, the tongba, which no one else would. So tongba, to some extent, meaning the the jar roxy and so on, that they they would use, they would use sometimes as recreation, on recreationally, but sometimes it was, as I said before, part of their rituals system. So this separated them. So there was a, a feeling, I think, an understanding that they were different, that they spoke a different language, had a different land system, which I obviously was, was focusing on mm -hmm. uh, with Kipot. Uh, they had a different religious set of religious practices, although they sometimes um, joined in the, the rituals of other groups, as I say, at Del Dasai and other times, but they had their own unique, different uh, culture, and they, um, they were aware of it, and they were not in the least bit um, shy about expressing themselves through their culture. So I think that uh, to the extent that there, there is still a Limbu Kura, to the extent that there are still Limbu rituals, uh, lim food practices, mm -hmm. marriage practices, um, they are, you know, aware of their difference and aware of, of their uni unity. Um, with the uh, loss of Kipot, um, it means economically they are more dispersed. They have to find some other way of making a living, find some other focus for their uh, for their uh, their their culture, um, it's no longer on the land. It's somehow elsewhere. Um, but you know, they're still limbos, and people are aware of themselves as limbos, um, and um, that's fine. <laughs> you know, they're they're um, they're not losing the sense of 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 being a community um, as long as as. Uh, uh, the language and the culture remain there. They'll, they'll be there for a long time to come. Uh, language and the rituals and that's, that kinds of the Eastern. So we don't, we don't have to be very frustrated. Uh, and the ritual part, that is the strong part of the Lindu. I think it's an important part. I'm not saying it's the main part necessarily, but it's to the extent that Limbus are able to, uh, um, to practice their own, their own rituals. Um, in their own way, in their own language, uh, you know, it's something that they they will have, continue to do. Well, um, do you have any message for especially to the Limbu community? Um, I don't think the Limbus need my uh, my fine words to, uh, to to carry on their own culture and their own society. Um, <clears throat> As far as fieldwork is concerned, I think more generally, if you go with a, a fairly open mind and you listen and you talk uh, as, you, as you, you, you make conversations and kura, as a kuragraphy as it were, um, then you're, you, know, you let the, the people among whom you're working lead you to where the important role is. For example, when I uh, contemplated, or when I was it was suggested to me to do fieldwork among the Limbu, I think the idea was that uh, already there had been a, a discussion of ethnography of um, a book about uh, the Magars. There had been a book about the Sherpas. There had been a book about this group or that group. So when you go to the Limbu, you do another book about the Limbu. But when I arrived to do fieldwork, the limbus there took me, as it were, led me um, on to what concerned them. And their concerns at that time, by and large, were about their kipot and how it was affecting their relationships with other groups, particularly the Brahmins. And um, it led me to to focus my study on what they felt were the most important things. Now, I have been, uh, or the book was criticized uh, to some extent, 
on uh, by some people saying, well, you were not, not very nice to the Brahmins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were not very nice to the high castes. Um, uh, or that you, um, you discussed this from the limbo point of view. Well, it was, I, I think I made it plain that I, this was a study from the limbo point of view. Um, and I don't think I need, should have apologized for that. I can admit that it was not entirely um, uh, always fair to the Brahmins, but I, it was the limbos who were expressing their feelings about the relationships. And this was good enough for me to, uh, to make that the focus of my, my study. So I think fieldwork has to allow itself to be, or your fieldwork has to be such that you can be led to uh, what to, to uh, expose what the people themselves want you to put, expose. And I think that is a good way to start anyway, your, your, your fieldwork. If uh, in Nepali anthropology, especially while we are doing some ethnography and anthropological work in the community level, and while we are going through the like a, a conflict, uh, have to uh, visit your uh, land and social change. Uh, I don't know you you have noticed or not. It is uh, almost like a Gita for the if we are writing something about the limbo in the uh, very uh, good reference for us like a newcomer writing. That is the uh, thing I want to express you and it's a very good honor to have you here and your passion to uh, bear my bad English. I really uh, thank you, sir. At last, uh, uh, okay. I want to make some uh, nostalgia for you, young age. In that age, you are very young while you are doing your fieldwork. Doing fieldwork uh, one year in the Limboa, you have uh, lots of uh, fun uh, and dhan nuts and the chapel nuts, something. Oh, I, did I do dhan nuts? <laughs> yes, yes, dhan nuts and chapel Sorry, nuts. Sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, are you asking me? Yes, of course. I, I I used to be visited sometimes by uh, by some of the friends, and they would want me to come and do dhanach with them. So I had to. I, it wasn't very difficult, but I enjoyed it. And uh, uh -huh. <laughs> but the trouble was that they wanted to go on all night. They could uh -huh. dance dhanach all night, and I couldn't. I was although I was young, I had to go to bed uh -huh. early enough. So sometimes uh -huh. I left before uh -huh. the end. But have, they would stay uh, and yeah. uh, and dance outside my house. Uh, ha have you learned uh, Have you learned uh, some um, palam also? The song uh, uh, used to sing in the uh, dhanas. Um, well, I didn't. I used to write it down, but I, I don't remember. Them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, how about the uh, chaprung nas? Uh, I yes, I used to. Um, of course, one of the things that I used to enjoy most about the wedding. Uh -huh. A limbo wedding was Chabrum. Uh -huh. And um, uh, on one or two occasions, they gave me the Chabrum and said, you can play. And I tried, but it's it's not easy because uh -huh. you have to dance at uh -huh. the same time. So I could play or I could dance. I couldn't uh -huh. do both. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your valuable time. I'm really thankful to you. Have a good day. Sewaro. Sewaro.